Most gracious and heavenly God, we come right now just in awe of all that you've done. God, as we prepare to celebrate the beginning of fall, allow our hearts to be open. Allow our minds to be expectant of what you have to say in our hearts on this day and every day. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Let us unite in the historic confession of our Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born under the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended in heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of our heart, and life everlasting. Amen. See, if you have children with you this morning, I hope you let them come spend a few minutes with Miss Hannah. nice outside did you notice the weather how cool it was it felt really good did y'all have a good weekend hi did you have a restful weekend kind of I love the weekends because I'm super busy during the week so Saturdays are known as my nap day like I tell mama don't call me on Saturdays because I'm napping I love to rest do y'all still take naps no yeah some of y'all Naps are wonderful, and you should take them whenever possible. <laughs> I love a nap. Um, so a lot of times we get really busy and we forget to rest, and rest is really important. Even God rested. In Genesis, after he created the world and created us and did a lot of work, he took a Sabbath. On the seventh day, he rested. And later, um, in the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy, he tells us again, that it's very important for us to rest. It's, he commands us to rest. So no matter how busy you get, you need to remember to rest. And the, when you get older, you'll, you'll find it's harder to, to take that rest. But you need to do that. And also remind your parents. When you see your parents working really hard, especially on Sunday, tell your mom and dad, say, hey, this can wait till Monday. Take the time off and rest. OK? You want to pray with me? All right. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this awesome weather, and help us to remember to rest. In your holy son's name we pray, amen. All right, you can come with me or go back to your parents.
begin to uh, reflect on what God has done for us this week and our need for him in our lives, I ask that you listen to the worship team as we sing this morning. We'll sing uh, through the first part of this song, Lord, I Need You Once. And then we'd ask that you join in as best as you can, uh, joining us as we sing this worship um, hymn that is very familiar to a hymn that you know. Please stand.
sin. As we come to our time of prayer, I invite you to see our prayer requests located on the back of our bulletin and, and remember those uh, there. Um, a couple, a celebration that's in the announcements as well as a uh, condolence. We um, congratulate um, Alex Moody and Becky Peterson on their marriage. They're not here this morning, but they were married earlier this month, but we also um, send our condolences to Becky on the death of her grandmother. And, um, and this week as well, um, the flowers this morning are, are in memory of Mary Lou Carwish, and I, I officiated her sister-in-law's service this week as well, and that family has lost three of their matriarchs this year. And uh, while we stood around and, and, and celebrated those lives, I know that family is mourning um, and so we remember that entire family this morning as we come to this time of prayer. If there are other needs or celebrations that you would like to share with us, I think there's some pew cards, or prayer cards located in the pew backs in front of you. I invite you to fill those out, place it in the offering plate when it comes by a few minutes. If you've not yet done so, I still ask you, invite you to fill out the attendance registration so that we might know who you are, how we might be able to better serve you. Will you join with me now as we go to God in prayer? Almighty God, we do need you. And we live in a world that needs you more now than it ever has before. Violence just seems to be unending, oh God. As this week has brought more violence, more hatred, more death. We pray for those in Nairobi, Kenya those that have died and those that are still under siege in that mall, that you would bring peace to that situation. You know, God, unfortunately, it is but one of many cases going back to our, the events at the Navy Yard in the last week and just throughout this country and around the world. Oh, God, we also are mindful as we gather for worship this morning that there are places in this world where people cannot gather openly to worship you and to profess you as God and Christ as Savior. Oh God, at this very moment, people are giving their lives for their faith. We're grateful that we live in a place that allows us to worship freely however we choose. We can choose to worship, we can choose not to worship. We can choose to believe, we can choose not to believe. But that choice is ours. And oh God, we understand that that freedom does not come without a cost. And we pray for those this morning that serve our country, that are stationed throughout this country and around the world, that have agreed to put themselves in harm's way to defend peace. And to share love throughout the world. Oh God, we each come this morning with our own prayer concerns for all that happens globally and locally. Each of us has our own needs, our own celebrations, those things that we're grappling with and those things that bring us joy. And God, you know each and every one of those prayers before we even utter them. Yet individually and collectively we come together and we lift up our prayers to you. Oh God, we're also mindful of the great gift of life and all of the gifts and things that we have and that we share. We acknowledge, oh God, that all that we have and all that we are is a gift from you. And those gifts you call upon us to share with one another. For each of us needs to share out of our abundance with those who are less fortunate. And, oh God, you've asked that we come and we give, not because you need it, but because we need to give, because we need to offer to you our tithes and your offerings. Our gifts acknowledge your goodness. And our gifts, when pooled collectively, when they're blessed and multiplied, when we're given wisdom to use those gifts, then they can make a difference in the lives of others not for our sake, but for yours. So, God, we ask this morning that you would accept these, our prayers, and accept these, our gifts, 
For we offer them to you in the name of Christ our Lord, who first taught the disciples and in us. When we gather, we should pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
I hope we never take for granted the excellence and more importantly, the passion with which Ariel and our choir lead us in worship each Sunday. Um, it's good stuff. Thank y'all. So we find ourselves in kind of the third week of this sermon series on the past, the present, and the future. The first week was homecoming, and we kind of shared the past, the present, and the future all in kind of one synopsis. And then uh, last week, we looked at the past. And if you weren't here last week, and if you haven't seen it online, I will tell you that we spent a lot of time talking about the past and how we view the past, how we let the past kind of dictate where we go. And, and I argued and suggested that the past can be viewed in two ways. It can be viewed as an anchor or a rudder. If we allow it to be an anchor, it holds us back. It prevents us from becoming all that God has in store for us. But if we allow the past to be a rudder, it can guide us toward the future. It can guide us in the direction that God would have us go. I also argue that we can be anchors and rudders in the lives of other people. Sometime, whether it's out of jealousy or, or, or just hatred or disappointment or other of the human conditions, those emotions that are not healthy for us, we, we might grab a hold of somebody now, I know y'all watch college football because I, I can't come in the door on Sunday mornings without being reminded of who won and who lost. The good news is, the state of Georgia is pretty happy this morning. But, but inevitably, on a Saturday afternoon as we're watching football, someone reaches out and grabs somebody's jersey and tries to hold them back. Now, sometimes it's in a tackle. Sometimes it's when a receiver's broken away and the only way the corner, cornerback can slow him down. Did you ever have to do that, Edwin? Did you ever grab anybody's jersey? Maybe, just hoping you get away with it. But in either case, they're trying to hold somebody back. By contrast, it's always fun to see a 300 plus pound lineman to make it down the field and, and to be running just behind or just beside a, a, a fullback or a, or a running back or a receiver that's broken free and they guide that person down the field. And they may knock a few people to the side along the way. We've got to determine that we're not going to be anchors in our own lives or the lives of others. So today that brings us to the present. I will tell you over the past, you know, really it's been, we've been working on this sermon series for the past couple months, and as I thought about the present, as we looked at the past and the future, what you realize is that the present is that, that really what I just said is in the past and what I'm getting ready to say is in the future and all I have is the breath that is coming out of my mouth at this very moment. And so in some ways, you want to just kind of jump to the future because there's a tendency to suggest or to think or to surmise that maybe the present doesn't matter. But the present matters a lot. Last week, if you were here, you, you noticed that we had the the theme, uh, kind of a nautical theme, and, and Stephen did a beautiful job of, of that. Last week, the, the rudder, in the, if you notice, there's a boat in the top left-hand corner. Last week, the rudder was highlighted, and this week, the propeller is highlighted. Uh, Stephen and I both agreed, and staff, as we discussed it in, in our worship planning meetings and our staff meetings, it's the propeller that moves us forward. It's also the wind. If we're in sailing, then we... we we, did, we depend on the wind to guide us or to propel us forward. And obviously in, in our tradition with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we think of the Spirit as the rush of a mighty wind coming at Pentecost. And so whether it's the, the propeller pushing us forward through the water or whether it's the wind filling our sails and moving us across the sea, there's, there's a force, there's something that is driving us toward the future. We love on vacations going to places where we can tour things. And one of our favorite things, it turns out, that we've toured are, are, are old boats. Um, at our most recent vacation uh, earlier in the year to New York City, we went to see the Intrepid. Um, and when they were trying to move the Intrepid, the, the old propellers got stuck in the muck. And they had to go and, and, and pull them out. But they had one. These propellers are massive to move these great, huge um, aircraft carriers. And, uh, and it was awesome to see the, the sheer power that one of those massive propellers creates. Of course, those propellers are driven by engines. They can be 
coal or gas or diesel or, or, they, or, um, or um, nuclear powered, depending on the vessel. And they steam ahead. But, but we need to kind of take a slice in time. We need to allow ourselves for this moment, for this Sunday morning, to think about the present and to think about how it connects the past to the future and what we need to do in these moments to protect what's going to happen tomorrow and next week and next month. There's several scriptures I'm going to share with you this morning um, that are all really tied together. They have a common theme. I'll start with Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, the third chapter, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 10 and 11 and 16 through 23. According to the grace given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid because that foundation is Jesus Christ. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, and they are futile. So let no one boast about human leaders, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, who is Peter, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All belongs to you, and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So, excuse me for shifting metaphors for a moment. We've been on a nautical theme for a week in the first part of this sermon, but, but, but Paul shifts to a, a common metaphor that he uses in preaching. He uses the metaphor of building. He uses the metaphor of the foundation upon which the church is built, and that foundation is God. Interesting that Paul should mention Peter, because Peter, Christ calls Peter his rock and says, upon that rock I will build my church. It's glad to know that someone as flawed as Peter can also be the cornerstone upon which Jesus builds the fellowship of those that will carry on the Christian faith. But as this text suggests that the foundation has been laid, and if we think about ourselves in present times, we are the ones building upon that foundation 160 some odd years have gone by since the first people gathered in a white frame building and endeavored to start a fellowship of Christians that would gather for worship and fellowship. Some 160 some odd years later, we in this beautiful facility and we, we are in the present moment and we have to be careful. We have to be careful about how we build It says that we have to do it with excellence. We can't put shoddy work on the foundation that has been built because that foundation is Christ, and Christ deserves better. Part of being in the present and part of what the present serves to allow us to do is to evaluate where we are. And this may be one of the, in the human condition, this may be the difficult, most difficult thing we are called to do. Very few of us like to look in the mirror. Very few of us like to be very introspective. Very few of us are willing to acknowledge the deficiencies in our lives. But that's exactly what the present is for. The present is for evaluating where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. And if we are not honest about that, if we can't evaluate and assess our current reality objectively, and with a discerning eye. If we can't make honest observations about where we are, if we can't be transparent about the places that we need to grow, then the future's meaningless. I um, 
we, we've got, I told you last week, and I'll continue to say it, we have the most incredible staff, and, and part of that staff time is, is, is we throw these things out there, and so Jeannie, several weeks ago, knowing that we were working on this sermon series, was in a, in a book fair or a dollar store, and she found this book by, by Fred Rogers, um, Life's Journeys According to Mr. Rogers, Things to Remember Along the Way. And, and there's a quote that we'll, we'll save for next week, but I, I had the opportunity to read through it. Most of you are probably aware, we all know who Mr. Rogers is. Most of you are also probably aware that Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister. Came from a very small town in Pennsylvania. Uh, grew up as kind of, a, kind of a pudgy little boy that had asthma and couldn't go out very much and wasn't very confident in himself. But he had people around him that were very encouraging and, and continued to lift him up and then in many ways he became the person who encouraged America and lifted us up and, and, uh, and, and made sure that we knew how important we were. Of course, those of us that grew up on Saturday Night Live also know Stuart Smalley, the, 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 the character that kind of made fun of Mr. Rogers. Anybody know who I'm talking about, Stuart Smalley? You're good enough, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough and doggone it people like me. A little bit of a paraphrase of Mr. Rogers. But we've got to be able to evaluate and assess, assess the current realities. And the way that we do that is we have to be fully present where we are. And, and this is one of the little writings that he shares with us. Here's a gift you may not have expected. It's a gift for you to give yourself. Sometimes in your day-to-day, -day, try to turn off all the noises you can around you and give yourself some quiet time. In the silence, let yourself think about something or if possible, think about nothing. Most of us have so few moments like that in our lives. There's noise everywhere. There are some places we can't even escape it. Television and radio are probably the worst culprits and Fred Rogers died in 2003. This book was published in 2005 and I would suggest that the internet and smartphones would be added to television and radio. They are so seductive. It is so tempting for some people to turn on the television set or the radio when they first walk into a room or get into their car to fill those spaces with noise. I wonder what some people are afraid of might happen in the silence. Some of us must have forgotten how nourishing silence can be. That kind of solitude goes by many names. It may be called meditation or deep relaxation, quiet time or downtime. Some might call it prayer. That's my editorial edition. In some circles, it may even be criticized as daydreaming. Whatever it's called, it's a time away from outside stimulation during which inner turbulence can settle and we have a chance to become more familiar with ourselves. How many times have you noticed it's the little quiet moments in the midst of life that seem to give the rest extra special meaning? We have to allow ourselves to pause and to stop and to reflect and to pray. We allow, have to allow ourselves to be fully present in the moment. And we have to be willing to look at ourselves with a critical eye. To know where we need to improve. And to know that we need God. Earlier in the same section, Fred Rogers writes... I realize that it isn't very fashionable to talk about some things as being holy. Nevertheless, if we want to rid ourselves of personal and corporate emptiness, brokenness, loneliness, and fear, we will have to allow ourselves room for that which we cannot see, hear, touch, or control. Our world desperately needs a sense of holiness. Our world desperately needs a sense of God's presence in our lives. Our world desperately needs a sense of love and compassion and truth. That's what this present time so desperately needs. In the letter to Timothy in the fourth chapter, the sixth through the tenth verses, we kind of hear this same theme. As Timothy is being encouraged... If you put these instructions before the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, nourished on the words of faith and on the sound teaching that you have followed. 
have nothing to do with profane myths of old wives' tales. Train yourselves in godliness. For while tri- physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. For this, to, for this end we toil and struggle, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. So Timothy is being told to be prepared, to be ready. We need to be physically prepared and mentally prepared, emotionally prepared, spiritually prepared for what the future has in store for us. Now next week's scripture will be from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I'll give you a sneak peek. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Read on its own, that is such a powerful verse, but we need to read it and hear it in context because it is in context of the exile. The Babylonian exile of the Babylonian exile of, of God's chosen people. Jeremiah 29, 1, 4 and 7 reads this way. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts. They had just been told that their exile would be 70 years years and and the prophet Jeremiah sends word that they need to settle in the land where they have been sent and they need to wait patiently for God and they need to continue on with the things that they're doing so that they might be prepared for the future the theme throughout all of this is a holiness it's a sense of God's presence it's a sense of Allowing ourselves to feel and to know God's presence. Present and presence. I think I've said this before, but I think one of the most difficult things for some preachers is being silent. We feel like maybe that was what we were called to do and we were sent to do. And so we feel this compulsion to talk. But I will tell you, there are some times and some places, and often that time and place is by a hospital bed or with a grieving family. Ministers are tempted to to say something. Pastors are tempted to say something. Loved ones are tempted to say something. But in that moment, what I've learned in 14 years of full-time ministry and many more years of being in the midst of need, that sometimes the most important thing we can do is stand or sit, touch, grab a hold of someone's hand, and pray that we can be God's presence for another human being. And we need the church to do the same thing. Sometimes we're so worried about creating more programs, more opportunities, more things for people to do, that we forget that the primary purpose and mission of the church is to be present in the world. It's not to be busy for busyness sake. It's not to say things for the sake of saying things. The church is to be fully present in the world so that the world might know God's presence. And so when we develop ministries and programs, they should have a purpose and a function, and that purpose should be able to draw people closer 
to God, not to just keep them busy or keep their minds off the world. Because part of what's going on in all these scriptures and part of what's happening is that each of these scriptures calls us to have God be at the center of our lives. And unfortunately in our world today, too many people use God as a vending machine. Too many people just go over and punch the button when they need God to be there for them. God is not a vending machine, but God created us and all that is around us, and God is the foundation of the life in which we live. And so if we have any hope of of doing what it is that God has called us to do in the future, we have to allow ourselves to be fully present where we are. And we have to create space for others to come. We have to allow others into God's presence. We have to invite others others into God's presence and be willing to be present with them. Then and only then can the promise of the prophet Jeremiah be fulfilled that that we might live into the plans that God has in store for us. We'll talk more about those next week. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's family said.
hymn number 452, My Faith Looks Up to Me. Will you stand as we sing verses 1 and 2? test if somebody wanted to join the church is having to stand on either side of me while I sing and they still they haven't run away yet um, just so overjoyed this morning as Aaron and Parker come to join our church Parker Martin and Aaron Devine y'all know they've been y'all been here for eight yeah a little over a year um, I went to lunch with them around Christmas time last year about joining the church and obviously didn't get them a nice enough lunch took a little longer I'm sorry. No, this is a special day, and Aaron and Parker have just jumped in in so many ways with, with Habitat, with serving with our Sunday school class that has been meeting, and so, so grateful to both of them. Um, uh, Parker's father is United Methodist pastor in North Carolina, um, and uh, Aaron, uh, and he's an, a student at Georgia State and put in the School of Public Policy. Uh, Aaron um, is uh, graduated, they both went to Wake Forest, graduated, and Aaron got a job in Atlanta um, in, in digital advertising, just recently got a promotion. Um, so Parker comes by way of transfer membership from the First United Methodist Church in Newton, North Carolina. Uh, Erin grew up uh, in, as a Catholic and doesn't know where her membership last was, but we said that didn't matter because she's coming here today, and so for that we're grateful. Um, but just so, so grateful to them and the energy they bring and the spirit they bring uh, to ministry here at Atlanta First. And so now it's my privilege as you come to join this church, I ask you very simply, and will you promise to support our Lord and this is church at Atlanta First United Methodist Church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, will you? So glad to welcome you as the numerous members of Atlanta First United Methodist Church. And they represent such a, a proud moment of our present and certainly represent where we're headed to in the future. So I'm grateful to welcome them this morning. I ask that they stand out here. I hope you will come by and uh, warmly welcome them as well. It, it, for our benediction this morning, I want to leave you with the words of Mother Teresa. She said, yesterday is gone, tomorrow is not yet come, we only have today, so let us begin. Let us begin as we go forth in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's family said. Amen.